Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this RedGamingTank.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We've got a ton of stuff to get through in today's video, but before I do that, I'd like to plug another video that I released, and that is on the PlayStation 5 and a machine learning patent. So if you're interested in the PS5, you should go ahead and check that video out. I'll, of course, link it in the video description and also at the end of this video. But getting back to today's topic, we'll start with AMD, as there is an update for RDNA 2 or Narve 2X. And this, of course, is the next generation of GPUs, which we expect AMD to launch by the end of this year and will likely be the RX 6000 series and will feature things such as hardware based ray tracing, variable rate shading and so on and so on. And they are shaping up to be very powerful GPUs indeed. We know of the existence of Narve 21, 22, and finally 23. Indeed, I first leaked the existence of Narve 21 and 23 and had said that AMD internally were calling these GPUs the NVIDIA killer, and they were apparently very confident in the performance of these GPUs. I'll, of course, still hold my breath a little bit because until I actually see the GPUs and how they compare to NVIDIA, well, you know the story. Anyway, AMD are getting really good at obfuscating IDs. So PC IDs and GPU IDs in general are becoming more and more confusing. And for example, Narve 12 has a different ID for Narve 10. The only difference between those two GPUs essentially is the fact that 12 contains HBM and also they kind of changed how things were anyway because let's say GFX X X X X so for example it could be I don't know 10 10 just for the sake of argument that used to be code names for specific GPU blocks but this was back in the days of like Polaris but now it's not such a thing anymore so it's still kind of ambiguous exactly what we're looking at with some of the names. But anyway, there is a fascinating um, report on videocards.com where they were digging through some of the patch notes on free desktop. And what they've basically spotted is that both Sienna Cichlid and also Navy Flounder both have the name GFX 1030, which possibly and I stress the word possibly means that they are the same GPU or perhaps are slight derivatives of that. So for example, one could be a prosumer version or perhaps designed specifically for gamers or perhaps one is designed for another usage entirely. This is one of those situations where unfortunately we are all left with even more questions than before this actual leak. I'm very interested to see how AMD's uh, next generation GPUs end up performing, quite honestly, because I suspect that uh, if nothing else, it's going to put NVIDIA on notice. Actually, we have some NVIDIA news in just a moment, but I would like to mosey our way to Intel. We have actually all of the big names in this video. We'll uh, be finishing off with some Xbox news. And this is Intel's 11th generation processors, aka Rocket Lake. Intel's Rocket Lake is a bit of an odd duck because it is an 8-core, 16-thread processor. Well, that's the highest-end SKU that we've seen thus far, and it seems to be the highest-end SKU that uh, Intel are planning to launch. It is on an enhanced architecture, although the exact details aren't clear, but looking at the cache layout, it seems to definitely bear some similarities with uh, the later um, architectures from Intel. But the reason that I'm bringing this up is because Tim Apisak, who is a very well-known leaker, has discovered an entry on the Sysoff Sandra database. And this seems to confirm that this particular processor, or I suppose architecture, can actually support PCIe 4 NVMe. 
And this actually lines up very nicely with a couple of motherboard vendors as well. Indeed, I actually put out a video when I was receiving a couple of boards that uh, more than one of them actually has reference for PCIe 4, but it mentions that that's for a specifically future architecture. Rocket Lake, of course, will be compatible with Z490. It is still HLGA, excuse me, um, 1200. Unfortunately, we don't have performance metrics as yet. It seems like it's going to be around 10 ish percent faster. That is IPC, just to be clear. But we don't have, obviously, let's say, a vast swathe of games and other benchmarks to really get a handle on things on how it performs. Rocket Lake is going to be kind of an odd duck. Um, and also, it would be very curious how they will be pricing these SKUs as well as marketing them as well, given, obviously, they will have way fewer cores than what AMD has with the uh, Zen 3 architecture, aka Ryzen 4000. I think, and this is a guess, once again, I don't have access to the performance metrics of these uh, unreleased CPUs exactly, but I think Intel might have a slight advantage in terms of gaming performance, and I say that for a couple of reasons. One, the samples we've seen hit uh, 5 gigahertz, and two, a 10-ish percent IPC gain possibly gets them a win. I still think that the improved architecture for Zen 3 with the unified uh, caches and stuff like that uh, for the per CCX is probably going to help a lot more in games. But I think Intel might have a slight lead in games. The thing is, though, will it be enough to convince someone to go with, let's say... I don't know what it's going to be called, I'll call it 11900 for the sake of this video. Or instead, would you prefer to pick up, let's say, a 4900? And yeah, obviously Intel have been under a world of hurt recently with uh, several rather interesting reports floating around that they may use TSMC for their CPUs, which would be... Well, let's just be honest, that would be a massive, massive change in strategy. I don't know if they'll use them long term, but if they did use uh, TSMC or another foundry for this particular purpose, it would be it would be very interesting on how that ended up going. And I mentioned that there was also some NVIDIA news as well. And well, I'm a man of my word. And this has been leaked by Twitter user kopity 7 kimmy Once again, if you've missed uh, previous news from this individual, they have been fairly accurate in the past with several things, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but of course you should still take this, as always, with a pinch of salt. And in the past, they've mentioned that the RTX 3090 is 5248 CUDA cores with 24GB of memories, the RTX 3080 has 43 52 CUDA cores uh, with 10 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. Uh, well, you can read on the screen for all of that stuff. They have said that uh, these GPUs are going to be pretty impressive, with the 3080 being around 20-ish mm, percent faster than the RTX 2080 Ti. I think that's pretty impressive. I assume that that is under traditional rasterization performance and not something like uh, hardware-based ray tracing. Either way, there was some reports that were floating around, uh, including from Kopity, that NVIDIA were aiming at 21 Gbps memory, which would be, well, let's just say interesting, given memory that fast is not exactly prevalent. But according to uh, their latest tweet, Nope, that's not happening. Tw the climb to 21 Gbps has failed. How about 19 to 19.5 Gbps? Which, well, would still be really fast and would still put out a crap ton of memory bandwidth if um, you have a GPU which has um, a 320-bit bus with 19 Gbps. You're going to have around 760 gigabytes per second of bandwidth and if it's a 384-bit bus, which is the rumor for the 1390, it could be a 
gigabyte, uh, gigabytes per second, and that's at 19.5. Obviously, if they go with slower, then that will affect memory bandwidth. I know I just said this in a previous video, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what the prices are for these next generation GPUs. I honestly feel that the consoles are going to not be able to compete with a card which is mid-tier next generation. So let's say for the sake of argument, 3070 Ti is probably going to pretty easily stomp the next gen consoles. There are of course some exceptions. I assume games which heavily take advantage of the architecture for the next gen. So let's say first party exclusives, that might be a bit of a different story because they're really going to leverage the architecture the best they can. But in general, I think that uh, PC gamers are going to be in for a really good time. It's I'm going to be really interested to see what a 3070 Ti or equivalent from AMD and let's say a 4700X is going to be capable of, especially in terms of pricing. And as I've mentioned many times now, my main interest in terms of the concerns of the console is how we're going to be dealing with things like hardware decompression. I've said a couple of times previously that you could basically brute force that with the SSDs of the next gen consoles by doubling RAM requirements, 32 gigs, and obviously having uh, NVMe drives become, well, standard for games. But also we might have some type of accelerator on say the GPU, which is uh, able to handle the hardware decompression as well. And in the final piece of news for today, I, Justine, who is a fellow YouTuber, I'll of course link her video in the description of this one, was speaking to Phil Spencer, who is of course head honcho over at Xbox. They spoke about a plethora of different topics, including backwards compatibility. And, well, he was teasing some things for not only that, but also a possible August event. I'll go into the first quote. Yeah, we saw all right and dirt at 120, and the frame rate and feel of the games is something that you're really going to feel with the launch of the Xbox Series X. I'm really impressed by the frame rates we've seen on backwards compatible games from the devs and back compat team, focusing on the investment of games that made in Xbox and making sure that that continues, whether that's in the controllers you already own, the games you already own, respecting a game's relationship with our products is just critically important to me, and that's something that's becoming a pillar for the team. Yes, I actually am really happy that Microsoft are putting a lot of focus on that, because let's just be honest, with the shift to digital, Microsoft are actually kind of doing one of the best things they can to help users feel more confident in adopting digital. And that is that they don't feel that they're just going to buy a load of games and then, well, those games are essentially trapped on a system which you're no longer able to play, really. I mean, just for example... Uh, PS3 games. There are obviously a lot of PS3 games which were remastered for the PS4, which is a separate topic, but there are also games which are still essentially, I don't want to use the word held hostage exactly, but basically trapped on the PS3, and if you um, don't have a PS3 plugged in, which not everyone wants to, or maybe your PS3 dies, or whatever, it's nice to just know that you can buy an Xbox 360 game now and still be able to play it on your Xbox Series X. And I really, really like that. There's also, of course, the teasing for the August event. Once again, I'll encourage you to check out Phil's full interview with iJustine, as I don't want to basically tell you everything he said because that's very unfair to her and her content. But long story short, he did tease that there would be an August event, which is... I think, well, it makes logical sense. So the question is, with the August event, what are we going to see? Are we going to see more games, but also Lockhart? Or is it just going to be focused more on business things? So for example, are they going to announce more studio acquisitions? And are they going to uh, discuss the pricing and perhaps release schedule of their consoles? What we do know is not all of their studios were shown off with the July event, but I think, honestly, Microsoft know that uh, people really made a meme of the Halo thing. I think that they made a mistake showing that version of the build. Um, some of it looked fairly polished, 
and then others, you could just tell that it was still fairly early in development. Um, and I will be curious to see what the final iteration of Halo Infinite looks like. I think it looks a fun game. I do. I think it looks pretty cool with the grappling hook mechanic, but there are definitely some elements which are still rushed, and there's also pop-in. Um, but obviously it's still not final, and they also stated that the build they shown was not the latest build, which, as I said, I think that they made a big mistake with that, but yeah. Um, with Microsoft, I really feel that they know that they're under the pressure at this point. They need to just blow us away with the August event. And one of the issues we're having is that a lot of the really cool games that Microsoft are working on, and this, to be fair, the same could be said for Sony, are not coming out for a couple of years. So, as I've said, um, and I, I know I've, you know, want to reiterate this a couple more times, but for me, what console to purchase is really going to be dependent upon the release schedule of games as well as what's available at launch. It's like, let's say for the sake of argument, uh, for the PS5, you have uh, the new Spider-Man game and one other game, but then there's nothing for like three months, four months, five months. Is it going to spur someone to purchase the system? It's going to be an interesting one. Um, especially, obviously, projects have also been really hit this year, mostly because of the world events and other things, and allegedly that's one of the contributing factors which held back development kits from MP, mass production. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. The normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.